Well, good morning, everyone. It is a thank you for inviting me to, to speak to you this morning. Uh, it's becoming a little bit of a tradition, hasn't it? Uh, I come up every year at this time of the year to, uh, to the poultry show here in, in, in Wangarei, and um, it seems that I get invited to take the service as well, so thank you for that. And it's always a pleasure for me to speak, uh, to speak from God's Word. Uh, it's been pointed out to me that there are some new people here who probably don't know who I am. Um, we're from the Fielding Church. Um, my wife is over here, and uh, she's with us today. Uh, that's Jan and Loretta's daughter. And I'm the Bible worker from Fielding. I do the Bible work for one day a week, just part-time, and uh, the church pays me to give my time one day a week. And uh, I just go out and uh, look for studies. We get leads from various places, and I begin to study with these people and, uh, in an attempt to, to build up our Fielding Church. And I just want to thank, there is a group of people here that, that pray for me sometimes. And um, uh, thank you for that. And uh, prayer certainly is working. We are having, we're having a good time in the Fielding Church uh, with the new people that are coming along. And uh, it's not just me that is doing it, the whole church is involved in it. And because uh, while I can bring the people through the door, they have to be nurtured and made friendly and people be friendly to them and, and uh, all these sorts of things. And um, that's what the rest of the church is doing, and uh, we are certainly enjoying it. It's a job I hope to do indefinitely, and um, until they give me the sack. But um, it's a job that I enjoy, I enjoy doing. There is no doubt about it that in the world we live in, we have never seen communication and the ability to communicate such as we see today, is it? We've never seen that anything like it in history before and it just gets, there are all sorts of things that I really know nothing about, Skyping and Bluetooth and, and, um, and even emails are a little, I, I sort of can, I just learned to do that recently, but the world is just gathering pace in its ability to communicate with other people and not necessarily making it a better place, but it's, it certainly is happening. And uh, I was thinking about uh, communication and, um, and, and things are not so complicated, in your mailbox comes these advertising flyers. You would get them up here as we do. And uh, they seem to come mostly on one day. At our place, we're on a rural delivery, and they come on a Tuesday. The other day I counted them, 17 individual leaflets advertising 17 different products and two, uh, two local newspapers. And the ability or the desire in these hard times, I suppose, for people to, to sell their products, they... Um, they're advertising furiously, and uh, there's just so many of them. I, I don't even read them. They just go straight in the recycling pile. There's just too many of them. You don't have time to read it. And sometimes it's a little bit like that with good stuff, isn't it? We get good stuff coming into our homes, magazines and, and all sorts of good books that I have in my library, some I've never read, just overload of information. And sometimes when I'm going to get a service ready and, I'm, and I choose a topic and I think, now what books have I got there? I've got a good selection of John Stott. Uh, commentaries, or, or, or um, um, Charles Spurgeon, uh, Arthur Pink, SDA Bible commentaries, they're good. Ellen White books, I've got most of them. <clears throat> but sometimes it's good to go directly to the source, because even though good as those books are, they're actually someone else's opinion on what the Word of God is saying. And so this morning, I'm just going to go to Exodus chapter 20, because almost all of Exodus chapter 20 is dictated by God. So you can't get much more accurate than that, can you? <clears throat> In fact, some of it, almost half of it, is actually written by God with his own hand. I want you to think back in your family history, and uh, I, I, I've done that with mine, and, and some families are into this sort of thing and some are not, but you might be able to trace your lineage back quite a way. There is some energetic person in, in my family that is traced our family lineage back to Henry VIII, 1500s. And uh, the Strawbridge family came to New Zealand in 1875 in a little ship called Dellum Tower, and there were 23 of them. The old matriarch, Sarah Strawbridge, was 77 years old. Uh, she had uh, several of her sons and one daughter and grandchildren with her. One of the sons was John, and he was in his 50s, and a grandson in his 20s. Grandson's name was Samuel. And... Um, <clears throat> 
After he'd come to New Zealand a few years, he found a young lady, married her, and they had eight children. And one of them was my grandfather. And uh, then, of course, my father and then myself. My father can remember Samuel Strawbridge. He was one of the grandchildren that came out in 1875. He uh, remembers his mum putting them on the train, and Dad grew up not far from here, just a Waitura, just uh, 20 miles or so south of here. And they hopped on the train and they went to see Granddad Samuel Strawbridge. Uh, only once or twice, because he died when, in 1933 when Dad was about five years old. So what I'm saying here is the first 140 years of family history for us is quite well known. Uh, Dad can remember his grandfather who came out on the boat in 1875. There's good records of that. We go one step further back, we came from England, uh, in a little, uh, little village south of England called Stockton, I've been there. Uh, there's still a Strawbridge family or two living there. Uh, the little church that Sarah, a uh, little church that they used to worship, and uh, the house where Sarah Strawbridge used to live, and the little shop she had, all still there. And we walked amongst the graveyard there, and there's uh, stuff going back into the early 1800s and some into the 1700s. But by that point, there's, there's not many stories, it's just names, really, just names and dates. And then you get back into the 1600s, and there's no stories. There's just a name and a date. So you go back 400, 500 years, and I really know nothing about my ancestors. I've got a name. What did they look like? What did they believe? Were they really Christians? I wouldn't have been the whole Church of England. Everyone had to be Church of England. But were they great spiritual men? Were they kind? Were they mean? I really know nothing much about them. And place yourself in that setting. How far can you think back to your family? Because you see, the children of Israel had been captive in Egypt, or not captive all of that time, but had been down in Egypt for 430 years. And they had heard stories about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They didn't know what they looked like. They really didn't know all, much, all that much about them, except what had been handed down orally. They had lost the spiritual content of their forefathers. It was so long ago. But something really bad had happened to them. It tells us there in Exodus chapter 1, verse 8, Then a new king came to the throne. And uh, probably Ahmed, the 18th dynasty of uh, of the Egyptians, and it said, this new king did not know who Joseph was. And it goes on to say in verses 9 and on, he looked around him and saw the children of Israel, and they were so numerous, he was afraid of them. Now something happened. How could they forget about Joseph? He was the one that saved Egypt and saved the surrounding civilization. During the time of Joseph, the people who ruled in Egypt were called the Hyksos. They weren't really Egyptians, they were actually Semitic in their, in their, in their origins. Uh, but they ruled Egypt at the time. Eventually there was civil war and the true Egyptians rose up and they conquered the Hyksos. Now the Hyksos were friendly with Joseph and all his family. The new Egyptians came in and they said, these Israelis, these Jewish people, they were friendly with our, with our previous enemies they might one day rise up against us, and so they enslaved them. They couldn't worship God anymore. All their freedoms were gone. We don't know what it's like to be a slave. But they had no freedoms. They couldn't worship how they wanted to. They couldn't live where they wanted to. And th this once treasured nation, this once privileged nation that was living in the most fertile part of Egypt, that was favoured in every respect, suddenly became slaves. And they forgot what it was like to live, like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It was only a vague memory for them. And so God said to them when the time came after 430 years, I'm now going to reach down and I'm going to take you out of the land of Egypt. And he did, and we'll come back to that in a moment. Let's just go to the Ten Commandments. So it's in this context of slavery, of forgetting what their forefathers had stood for that God gave to them the Ten Commandments. From now on you shall have no other gods before me. That was new to them. 
The Egyptians had thousands of gods and they had adopted quite a few of them. That's to finish, God said, no more. And I don't want you to make any graven image or any idols. They had thousands of those as well. I don't want you to do it anymore. There's only one true God. I want you to take my name uh, carefully and respectfully. And here's something really new for you. I want you to keep the seventh day Sabbath holy. They'd had to work seven days a week before this. This was something completely new to them. It's an interesting thing in my work as a Bible worker that the Sabbath is always an interesting time when you take people through the studies. And quite a number of people that I work with uh, do the Beyond series DVD. And the first seven or eight are quite... Um, quite... Uh, Universal, that's the word I'm looking quite universal to all religions. And, and I say to him, up till now, you really haven't disagreed with anything that I've presented to you. Here's number nine. This will be something for you to think about. It's on the Sabbath. I've been visiting a young lady, solo mum, uh, for about a year now, and she came to number nine. Now, this is her second lot of DVDs that she's been watching. And I said to her, how did you find it when I went back? It's quite good, she said. I can't find any fault in it. There's another one that comes after, which tells about, uh, which tells about how Sunday came, and came to worship. She watched that one. And then she did the State of the Dead. And I, I needed to have a conversation with her. I needed to sit down and talk with her about it because she was convinced of the truth of it. And um, I went back and I tried to arrange this with her and I went back to see her and I said, well, you know, what are you going to do about it? You said that you can't find fault in it. Essentially, you're agreeing with it. Um, what are you going to do about it? She's a brand new Christian. She's only, she was baptised last year in her own church. She says, well, I like my church. I've got relations in that church. I'm quite happy where I am. And she didn't want to do anything about it. You see, the Sabbath is a dividing line. Ezekiel 20, verse 12. God said to the children of Israel, I have given you my Sabbaths. You'll know the one. I've given you my Sabbath that it will be a sign between you and me. This will be the sign that you belong to me. You can c compare that with Revelation chapter 13 where Satan has his sign too. He's going to in the future. It's probably not all that evident at the moment. In some ways it is, but uh, there's going to be a certain sign. It's called the mark of the beast. And amongst other things, that mark of the beast is going to be people worshipping on a different day. Man's day. It's even got a number, 666. That signifies man's number. And so Satan has a number, Satan has a day, God has a number, God has a day. Sabbath is God's sign as to whether you are a follower of his or not. I'm studying with another man, uh, and he's been a Christian a long time. Uh, he belongs to one of the Pentecostal churches in Fielding. And I've been, I've been talking about him, with him, with the Sabbath for some time now. I gave him a very good book that deals with all the Sabbath questions. And he's working his way through it slowly. He's quite a scholarly sort of person, knows his Bible very well. But he still hasn't accepted the Sabbath. It, it is hard. He's been worshipping on Sunday for 40 years. And I said, look, everything I can tell you in this book, if you don't believe it from this book, there's nothing more I can give you. He said to me last time I visited, he said, if a Bible flew out of a plane and landed in, the, in, in some remote village, would they come up with the Sabbath? I said, well, in actual fact, they would. And I told him the story about the Pican. I said, have you heard of the mutiny on the mountain and Captain Bly? He's well read. Yes, I have. I said, that's exactly what they happened. They found a Bible. No one there to instruct them. And when people arrived years later, they found them keeping the Sabbath. It happens. Sabbath is an important one. And then we go through the rest of the commandments. Uh, honor your parents. Respect for people. Don't kill. It's surprising God has to tell us people this, isn't it? But you shouldn't murder. Don't commit adultery. 
that was a biggie for them as well. In the uh, immoral society of the Egyptian society, that was a biggie. It's interesting to note that people who do statistics and things like that, we as an Adventist church don't fare all that well in that department. We're not all that different from the world out there. You know, I used to work with a, with a, with a man one time, carpenter, and uh, he knew that we were Adventists, uh, several of us were Adventists that I worked with, and he said, I'm not really all that, you know, what's, what's so big about this religious thing? I'm the same as you guys. And the trouble was, I knew what he lived like. He cheated on his wife regularly. He used to talk about it at work. And I couldn't say much to him because he knew an Adventist that was doing the same thing. What could I say to him? <clears throat> then we go on to, uh, you should not steal. You should be honest, number nine. Don't covet. Honesty's a big one too, isn't it? I had an interesting uh, example about this that happened uh, just two or three weeks ago. I used to drive a, a very old bomby Ford Escort 1998 with a little 1.8 diesel in it. It was a brilliant car. It only ever broke down on me twice in the 12 years that I owed it. And they were things that were minor nature. But eventually the bumper fell off and the spoiler fell off and then the, the key ignition went on me where I could turn it on but I couldn't turn it off. And the radio went and the inside light went and they had two two cracks in the windscreen and another stone chip and I thought, doesn't really look very good anymore. I won't get another warrant. So when it ran out, I took it down to the wreckers and I said, I can get $200 for scrap. How much will you give me? He said, I'll give you $250 for it. I said, done. <clears throat> he said, now you need to take the number plates off and you need to um, go down to the, um, to the land transport office and deregister this vehicle. And so he wrote me out a cheque and, uh, and he said, um, this is a diesel, are you up to date with your mileage? I'm never up to date with my mileage, I'm always behind. <clears throat> and no, I was 5,000 k's behind. He said, well, when you go there, because you have to put down your mileage, uh, just fudge that a little. And he said, knock 5,000 k's off because I was 5,000 over. And he said, then you won't get charged for it. The trouble is at the bottom, you have to sign a form that says, I don't mind taking money off the government, that's fine. But when you have to sign at the bottom that you've actually s filled out this form correctly, that's sort of telling a lie, isn't it? So I, I just thanked him. I knew he was trying to help me. And I went down to Vehicle Testing New Zealand, where they're the Land Transport Agency. I filled out the form, and I got to the place where I had to fill out the mileage. Oh, I was tempted to knock 5,000 k's, because they're only taking your word for it. And I thought, oh, I hesitated, but I filled out the correct mileage. It's twice I've been tempted. I went up to the counter and I presented it to the very helpful young man there, and he read through it, and he said, um, oh, you realise you're over your mileage. He said, I can fix this up for you now if you like, and we'll just knock 5,000 k's off it. The third time I was tempted, I mean, what could I say? He was an agent for LTSA. Surely that would be fine. I said to him, no, I need to be honest, leave it as it is. And it went through, and I expect they'll send me a bill for it one day. You know, when you've done something good, you're meant to feel, when you've done something honest, and when you've resisted Satan, you're meant to feel good about it, aren't you? I walked out the door, then I felt bad about that. I thought, $250, I have to work a day for that. A day's work wasted, and I could have had it. <clears throat> You know, if the gospel of Jesus Christ doesn't make you any different to anybody else, then it's not a true gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ should make us different people to everybody else out there. It should change our lives. Time sneaking. I've got lots of things I could tell you, but I'll tell you about another lady that I'm studying with, a brand new Christian. She started coming to church at Christmas time. I didn't see her that day. I was busy talking to someone else. She slipped in and went back out again. <clears throat> and um, I, I was upset that I missed her. She was, a potential, she was a potential client of mine, a potential Bible study person. And, um, however, a few weeks later, she turned up again, just sort of slipped in quiet in the back seat. And this time the head deacon caught her and said, no, just wait here. I'll get Murray for you. And I got her details. Went round to see her that next week. Now, she, she was a very proud Nadi Perot lady, married woman from the East Coast, proud of her culture and uh, 
everything that that stood for. But she had worked in a um, had worked in a, in a, a rough environment there. Her, her lifestyle was uh, she worked in the forestry, worked in the wool sheds, worked hard during the during the day, and drank hard at night. That was her lifestyle. <clears throat> She met her husband and he took her away from that and bought, bought her to Fielding 13 years ago, but um, her family is still involved in that lifestyle. She was sick of the lifestyle that she was in, and uh, that's why she was coming to church. I began to study with her and um, she had a desire to give up smoking. And normally I wouldn't worry about that. There are more important things to worry about than smoking in the, in the, in the initial stage. But she seemed to keen to give it up, and um, she had almost given up smoking. She told me she had. They don't always tell you the truth, but she told me she had given up smoking. I suspect she hadn't quite given up. And I said, now you're going back home. I said, remember how you used to live. I said, those people still live like that. You are now a new Christian. You have changed. So you have to be strong. You have to stand up by yourself. It didn't happen. She was too new. She came back, she was really upset about it, and uh, she was feeling all down, and I said, look, we're just going to forget about that, forget about giving up smoking, forget about all those things. What you need to do is to learn about Jesus Christ. You need to develop your relationship. We'll work on that first. And uh, she used to work in a, um, in, in, a, uh, in a dementia ward in, a, um, in, a, uh, in an old folks' home. And it might not have been an old folks' home. I'm not sure. There, there was anyhow. There was this one, one patient there, and um, she was in this ward by herself, and she shouldn't have been. And they never told her that there was one patient there that had a tendency towards violence. And she was getting him ready for bed. Had her back turned to him, and he came behind her, grabbed her, and threw her across the room. And she hit her back uh, on a on a on a drawer that was just pulled out. And um, <clears throat> she hasn't been out of work since. She has a lot of pain in her back. I said to her, why don't we ask God to take that pain away about two weeks ago? And uh, she wasn't against that. And uh, so we, we prayed about that. And uh, she rang me. I rang her on the Friday night. This was just last week. I rang her on the Friday night to talk to her about something else. She said, were you praying for me last night? I said, yes, I was. I pray for you every night. She said, that pain's gone. I saw her the next day, Sabbath, that was regional day last week. I said, is the pain still gone? I'm, I'm a man of little faith. I said, is the pain still gone? She said, I have no pain. She said, I've slept the best that I've slept for years. <clears throat> I saw her again Tuesday, the pain's still gone. Yes, it is. She had, a, she had a new outlook on life on Tuesday when I went round there. She normally has her hair sort of hanging over her face. She had it tied back. She was looking smart. She had a spring and a step. She said, I'm now looking for a job. It's just amazing to, to watch people as they grow in Christ. And these other things begin to drop off. Next time when I come here, if you ask me to preach again next year, I'll tell you whether she's given up smoking. Maybe she's been baptized by then. I'm just amazed at how God works in people's lives for those that will give their hearts to him. And this was the same for the children of Israel in Exodus chapter 20. Because you see, God says in verses 1 and 2, I am your God, I have brought you out of Egypt, therefore, and he tells them the Ten Commandments. When did he give them the Ten Commandments? Before he delivered them or after? After, didn't he? He went down and with a strong hand, while they were still worshipping idols, while they were still being immoral, while they were still disrespecting God's name, with a strong hand he reached, them out, reached down and pulled them out of Egypt. He said, now I've saved you. This is how I want you to behave. Any spiritual lesson there? You see, God tells us in Romans 5, chapter 8. You go back to... Uh, Romans 5 at verse 8, and go back to verse 7. There's a small chance, it says in verse 7, there's a small chance that someone might risk their life for a righteous man, or maybe even for a good man. But Jesus Christ came down here, and while we were yet sinners, in verse 8 now, while we were yet sinners, Jesus died for us. 
He paid the price for our sins before we even wanted it, before we even asked it, before we even knew we needed it. He says, now I have paid the price for everybody who has ever lived. Now, unfortunately, most people are not going to take any advantage of that. Most people are going to die a death and never be resurrected again, at least not to eternal life. Even though Jesus has paid the price for them, even though he has saved them, they walk away and say, no thanks. I don't, want to, I don't want someone else controlling my life. I don't want to behave like this. I don't want to be a Christian. What a waste. What a shame. If I had a title for the sermon today, I would call my sermon today, Exodus 20, The Gospel Sandwich. You see, the Ten Commandments are the meat in the sandwich. They are the filling. And one, si one slice of bread is what I've just told you. God reaching down in his grace and redeeming us. That's one slice. The other slice that goes on the other side is found at the end of Exodus chapter 20. Let me read it to you. <clears throat> then the Lord said to Moses, Tell the Israelites this, You have seen for yourselves that I have spoken to you from heaven. Do not make any gods to be alongside me. Do not make for yourself gods of silver, gods of, gods of gold. Make an altar of, of earth for me and sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, your sheep and goats and your cattle. Wherever I cause my name to be honoured, I will come and bless you. If you make an altar of stones for me, do not build it with dressed stones, for it will defile it when you use a tool on it. Significant spiritual lesson here. God says, now, I have redeemed you. I have rescued you out of Israel. I now want you to behave like this as sons and daughters of mine. But I still don't want you to think that you can work your way to salvation. That's what this is about. Because when you come to offer your sacrifices, you don't even have to make an old, you can just mound up a bit of dirt, God said. In fact, that's probably preferable, and you just offer your sacrifice on that. But if you, if you do want to go a little bit further, or if there's no topsoil around or dirt, you can just gather a few stones, put them together, and put your sacrifice on top of that. But I want you to be careful, don't put a hammer to them. I don't want you to chisel it, because God knew that some people would get all carried away with it, and they would make themselves a flash altar. Or look at the altar that so-and-so's got. He's made a lovely job, brickwork job there. Look at the way he's fitted those stones together. God says, I don't want you to contribute anything to my sacrifice, because you can't. It'll be offensive to me. The sacrifice that you are offering is all of me, and you can add nothing to it. That's the gospel sandwich that I've given to you this morning. God on Calvary paid the debt for every sin that's ever been committed, every one that you have committed and will commit. God has paid the debt for it. It's up to you whether you choose it. And God says, when you do choose it now, I want to change your life. I want to make you into a better person. Why? So that men may see your good works. Why? That they may glorify the Father, that you'll be a witness to other people. But on no account must you think that somehow you contributed to that. Like Alan White says, not one stitch of the robe of righteousness is of human devising. And so as we grow in grace, as we seek God's goodness, as we seek his mercy, above all as we seek his salvation, may God bless you and help you in your walk with him this week. Thank you. Oh, Heavenly Father, Rock of Ages, Redeemer, Gracious Saviour, thank you so much for what you have done for us. While we were still sinners, Lord, you thought of us. Before the foundation of this world, Lord, you knew you were going to die for us. Thank you so much. And Lord, my prayer this morning is that each one of us will accept your goodness, your grace, your mercy. That we'll accept that uh, gift on Calvary. <clears throat> that you'll come into our hearts and change us, Lord. You'll make us your people. You'll make us true witnesses for you that other people may be saved in the kingdom as well. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.